Let's show the derivation of the Hagen Poiseuille equation from the Navier Stokes equations. There's actually a couple of derivations from, for the Hagen Poiseuille flow. This one would be for flow in a cylindrical tube. What we have here is a pressure gradient on the y direction on a tube of radius A. So the pressure gradient is dp dy on the y direction. The system of coordinates that we're using here is a three-dimensional tri Cartesian coordinates with components x, y, and z. Remember that we have unit vectors here in the direction x, unit vector y, i, the unit, vec unit vector j in the direction y, and the unit vector k here in the direction z. So the flow here is in the direction y. We have no components of flow in the directions z or x, but the pressures here are acting in this xz plane. We're considering a viscous flow, so we're going to derive the Poiseuille equation or the Hagen Poiseuille equation from the Navier Stokes equations. First of all, we're assuming that the velocity vector does not vary with time at each point, so the flow is in steady state condition. Flow at each point does not vary with time, so we can set this equal to zero. We have no external forces or body forces acting on a fluid, so we can also set this F term here to zero. So we're left with this form of the Navier-Stokes equations. We have the convection term here. We'll show in a little bit that this also goes to zero. We have the pressure gradient here, and we have the Laplacian here, which is represented as a triangle. So the pressure gradient or the gradient of the pressure here in the Laplacian of the velocity field or the velocity vector here. We're also assuming that the flow is, we're also assuming that the density is constant, so this will imply that the divergence of the velocity vector is equal to zero, like, like we've seen in previous derivations. As we, as we mentioned before, because the flow is only on the y direction, the component of the velocity that we're, we're interested in is, in is the v component. So remember that this vector here is composed of the components y, v, and w using the notation of bachelor, for example. And this here, those both those components here are zero. So we're only considering here the v component of the velocity field here. We already mentioned that the divergence of the fluid is, is zero. This would, it's actually important because this would imply that this component here is zero, but we'll show that why this component here, the, the convective term here is, is, is zero of the velocity field. So remember, the velocity field here is, has components E, v and w or corresponding to the directions i, j, and k. Also remember that, that the gradient vector here can be represented as the partial deriv derivatives in x, y, and z and the directions i, j, and k. I'm putting this here so when we expand the Navier-Stokes equations it's easier for you to understand what I'm doing. But I'm going to First of all, I'm going to expand this convective term here, and then later on, I'm going to treat the, the pressure and the Laplacian of the velocity field components. So expanding here, what I'm doing is I'm putting these velocity fields here, and then applying the gradient vector, the gradient operator here. We have scalar product here corresponding to the u dot del here or u dot nabla here 
And we first we're gonna treat this dot product here, remembering that if the indexes here are equal, this is one, and if the indexes here are different, for example, i dot j, this is this is zero. When we do this multipli multiplication, this actually means that we're doing the direct multiplication here, term by term, because we don't need to do to expand the products here because we already know that if the indexes are different, this is zero. So this leaves us with this term here, and because the indexes here i dot i is one, they do not appear in this product here, this expansion. So this is expansion. So this is actually a scalar. Now we can apply the distributive property to the velocity vector. But because we already told that this is zero, the velocity component in i is zero, and the velocity component in k is zero, actually what we have is this term here multiplied by using the distributive property in each of these terms here. So, uh, we are left with this here. These terms here, u and w, they're equal to zero. So that's a double, we have double the reasons here to show that those terms here are actually equal to zero. Also, because of that, we are left only with the v del v del y in a j direction here. So this is the component of interest in, in this in, in, in this context. But because the velocity does not the v component of the velocity does not vary in y, this is also zero. Why does this is not vary in in y? We have flow in the tube here. If you think of each velocity line here, this is the distance y. This velocity cannot vary in y because the, the fluid is not compressible. The fluid is incompressible. If you have expansion here, you have velocity variation, you, you have expansion or compression or the fluid, and this cannot happen. So each line here is a line of constant velocity. For now, we don't know the geometry of those lines here. So this is also zero. We are left with this form here, but because you have whole, the density in the both sides can multiply by the density in both sides and then it will cancel. So this is Stokes equation. Now our problem is to solve Stokes equations. Let's consider here the, the, the equation and let's again expand the gradient term, the gradient operator and the Laplacian operator here, operator here and see what happens. Remember that the Laplacian operator, I'm using the triangle representation here, but La, the Laplacian is nabla squared. So it operates on a vector or on a scalar and is the second order partial der derivatives. In this case, this operator acts on a scalar, act as a scalar, but here it's going to be operated on a vector, operating on a vector. We already showed you showed you the what the gradient operator is. So expanding the greater uh, gradient operator here in pressure, which is scalar, we have the partial der derivatives on directions i, j, and k, or x, y, and z. And expanding the Laplacian here, we have the second order part which are the derivatives. And expanding the velocity vector here, we have the velocity components in directions i, j, and k, or x, y, and z. Remember, we already told you that this is zero and this is zero. So what we have here is the partial derivatives, second order deriv derivatives, multiplied by the v component of the velocity vector. So we can just expand this here, we can just multiply this here using the distributive property, and you're gonna have the velocity multiplied by the partial derivatives, the 
corresponding to x, y, and z. Second order partial derivatives of x, y, and z. This mu here is just the viscosity as usual. Now, what happens to the pressure? The pressure does not vary in the z direction and does not vary in the y in the x direction. It only we only have a pressure gradient here in the y direction. So both of these terms here are set to zero and we are left with this form of the equation. The partial derivative of pressure in y, j direction, viscosity times the partial derivative, second order partial derivative of v, the j direction, and the x here component, the partial derivative, second order partial derivative component corresponding to the z direction here of the v component of the velocity vector. Since all of them are in the same direction here, the j direction, we can ignore this j direction because we're solving this equation in only one dimension, only one direction. So there, it's not a big concern. We can ignore this j term for, for the rest of the derivation. Now, what we're going to do is that we're ex going to express this again as the nabla operator, nabla squared, which, which is the Laplacian. So this is the Laplacian here in only two directions. It doesn't matter if you have three or two directions, it's still the Laplacian here. Why are we doing here? Because if you want to solve this equation in x and z, you're going to have a lot of, it's, it's going to be a lot more difficult than if we do this simplification by bringing the Laplacian again and then using the Laplacian operator in cylindrical coordinates instead of Cartesian coordinates. Why this is so convenient? Because first, what we have in our tube is the cylindrical geometry. So it makes a lot of sense to solve this equation in cylindrical coordinates. What we have here in, for the Laplacian in cylindrical coordinates, we're going to have components corresponding to the radius of the tube. So R here, remember that R here is a variable from 0 to A, which is the radius of our tube. In phi, which is this angle here, this internal angle, if we rotate this radius along the, the circle here, and H is the height of the tube, or it's our Y dimension in our original tube. So the velocity does not vary with the h or with the y component as we mentioned before and it does not vary with the phi angle here because if you take the cross section of the tube here if you take the velocity in this point say some radius b here and we rotate this by phi and we take it again the velocity is the same if we rotate here. So in this, this circle here, the velocity will be, dot, be the same. If we took like b over 2, then the velocity is different, but over b over 2 circle here will also be the same, so it does not vary here. So now we write this, we write the Stokes equation as dp dy, ignoring now the components, and we replace here the Laplacian in cylindrical coordinates. And because we ignore those terms here, or, or those terms don't, don't, don't matter for our derivation, we are left with this equation. So, hagen poiseuille equation is the solution of this differential equation. The difference here is that we have, I'm going to show you that we have an ordinary differential equation, while here you're going to have a partial differential equation because you have two dimensions here plus this derivative here. But this derivative here we're not going to worry about because to solve this equation we're assuming constant pressure gradient. So this is the pressure gradient in y. This has to be constant because otherwise we cannot ignore the velocity component of the the Navier-Stokes equation as, as we, we, we the time derivative of the velocity vector because if the pressure is varying the velocity will vary with time and then we have a most, more, 
much more difficult problem to solve than simply the uh, time constant, the Navier-Stokes equation. So because this is constant here, the pressure gradient, we can treat this as any regular constant and we're left with a simple ordinary differential equation. How do we solve this, this differential equation? By integrating. This is same as analogous as a second order differential equation because you have two derivatives here, dv, d, dr, have an r here, but this will happen as the, it will be the same as if you're solving a second order differential equation by doing two uh, consecutive integrations. So to simplify this, let's just treat this as a constant. Let's call this constant g, probably g for gradient. This is on most older fluid mechanic, mechanic fluid dynamics books for the negative here like they do in those books. So replacing this g term here for dp dy, it, it would be minus g. So this is the equation that we need to solve. We're going to first solve this external derivative. We're going to do separation of, of, of the components here, v, and grouping similar components in each side. And then we do the integration. We don't have to worry about this r here because it's inside here of this term, which we're going to treat later. What I like to do here when I am solving these kinds of problems is to put the constant term here outside and then solve for the, the, the component of the derivative here in r because r where the derivative is in R here, you have to integrate with this R term here. And then we take the V to the other side. So the integration on this here gets rid of this dV here. And the integral of R dr here is just R squared, R squared over R plus obviously a constant of integration because we don't, we're not using the limits for the integration. The limits will be useful when we use, apply the boundary conditions to the, the problem. Now here there's two ways of solving this. Some authors just multiply apply this g over mu using the distributive to, to both ter terms and then they solve the second integral. I, I like to group this here as a separate term. The so it makes me easier for me to organize the problem. So what we need to do this, it's now integrate to get rid of the second derivative term here. First thing we have to separate here the two terms and put the terms corresponding to each uh, differential here together. So we pass this R here to the other side so this cancels with the squared here and we have r here on the denominator of c1. Now we can integrate again. Again, I'm putting the g over mu outside. Some authors will let it be inside here. The path will be a little different, but it will be the same result in the end. The integration here gets rid of the, the differential here. So we are left with v. And the integral here is r squared over 2 by times 2 r squared over 4. The integral of 1 over r is log r. And we have a second integration constant here for the second uh, integration. Now we can apply the boundary conditions to our problem. The boundary conditions are we consider viscous flow on a tube. The conditions are we're, remember that we're considering a tube of radius A, and R is a variable that goes from R to A. R is zero at the center of the tube, and A at the, the, the walls of the tube. Because of the viscosity condition, we know that the velocity is zero at the walls. 
because of the fluid, pro fluid properties and the viscous flow, the velocity is zero at the, the walls. So the velocity is zero at R equals A. And the velocity is maximum at the center of the two. This is not particularly relevant right now for the boundary conditions. The important part of the boundary condition that we need to apply there, here is this one. Another issue that's important here is that the only possibility for us to solve this, to apply the boundary conditions to this equation here is that C, the constant C1 needs to be zero. It needs to be zero because if we apply the radius equals zero, the log logarithm of zero here is undefined. So we, we could not solve for this boundary condition, we'll get infinities here, here. So the only possible solution is that this constant is equal zero. So we can, we don't need to apply the logarithm of zero here and get into this problem. We're left then with V is minus G over mu, mu R square over four plus C2. So the, well, the work that we need to do here is find this constant C2. This constant C2 is now find, found can now be found by applying this boundary condition here. If you apply V equals zero, R equals A, you have zero here and you have A here. So essentially C2 is equal G over mu, A squared over four, which is what is showing here. This should be a plus here, but this shouldn't affect the rest of the... Sorry, no, it's right. It's, it's minus here, because when you expand this here, minus or minus with plus here, with positive here, it's minus. So it's, it's okay. Now we have to apply this for to this equation here, and we get the Poiseuille equation. So what this equation is saying is that when R equals zero at the center of the tube here, the velocity is maximum. And when R equals A, the velocity is zero at the walls of the tube. To apply this equation, you just need to, to have the pressure gradient here, which is what we find we will find find is in most problems. So G, remember, it's minus dp dy. And most problems will give you a value of pressure. Let's say P1 here and P2 here. And we, they will give you the length of the tube here. So G, it's actually minus P1 minus P2 or P2 minus D1 over L. This the sign here will just give you the direction of the flow. So it, it doesn't really matter in the end if it's P2 minus P1 or D1 minus P2. You can just treat here as delta P over L. And then you have the velocity uh, as a function of the radius. This will show us that if you have here the z direction here and the y direction here, you have a parabolic velocity profile here in the z direction. So we solved here as a function of the radius, but in essence, you have a parabolic velocity profile here. But at each y here, the velocity is constant. So if you think about in terms of velocity vectors here, we have here is a parabolic profile. Of course, this is because you have quadratic terms here in this equation. Now, we want to find the discharge or the, the volume of water per unit time that is flowing through this tube. So remember, this is the velocity. The velocity here, we have the dimensions of length over time for example, meters per second. We, want to we, we now want to find the 
discharge and the discharge we're going to represent as bq here which is length cubed over time in, in the si or international system of units you have for example meters cubed over second now what we need to do is because we know the velocity one point here at the center for example what we need now is to integrate this velocity over this area of the tube so now we're looking at the cross section of the tube so q, q is the integral of the velocity here from r equal zero to r equal a what we're doing here is that we're integrating around an element of perimeter of the circle so an element of the perimeter here would be correspond to 2 pi r dr so 2 pi r is this perimeter of here of this circle or the circumference of this circle times an element dr here of the the of an, an element of circumference here of this of this circle where, where the flow is taking place so if we integrate this we're going to cover the entire area here and then we have instead of a, a flow in meters per second we have a volume of flow so this integral here it's pretty straightforward I do this I think it's easier if I take all the constant terms here and put it outside the integral and I'm integrating over I'm just integrating each term separately separately you can do it all at once but I'm just for more pedagogical results I'm integrating term by term so because we have a, a, a subtraction here if it was a sum it would be the same thing thing I'm applying the integral term by term and uh, the differential also goes term by term so the integral of r remember that we multiply this r here by this a here so the integral of r times a squared is r squared over 2 and the integral of r cubed is r to the power of 4 over 4 I have not applied the limits of integration yet so the limit is from 0 to a from 0 to a here and when it's 0 it just cancels out so what we have is here is a squared over 2 times a squared a fourth 4 over 2 and here a 4 over 4 this is actually it's simply here we can just put this a4 outside here is one half over one four it's simply uh, one fourth so we have four times four sixteen two here two over sixteen is one way eight so this is the equation for the discharge it's proportional to the fourth power of the radius of the tube so the larger the tube the discharge will increase by a, a, a fourth power but remember that because we are dealing with laminar flow where we model the lines of flow here sliding one over another we are constrained to fairly slow velocities of flow and very fairly small discharges if we you use this these equations in your engineering practice you're going to come up with unrealistic unrealistic values of discharge and uh, velocities we're constrained to fairly small Reynolds numbers so the flow has to be laminar if you have turbulence or if you have real tubes none of these equations will be valid and we need corrections like for example 
Darcy Weisbach equation and or uh, uh, all sorts of empirical tables. But this is the derivation of the hagen poiseuille flow from the Navier-Stokes equations. The next one of the next derivations that I, I should I might do is for the flow between two plates.